Operating on safe code is very difficult. Uh, if you have lots of it, it becomes extremely complicated. And typically the tool we have in Rust for sort of making these large code bases easier to work in is you write an abstraction so you don't have to think about everything. And I don't actually remember what my next slide is. Uh, okay, that, I should be on this one. So typically the tool we have for this is abstractions. And in unsafe code, we often write abstractions to fully encapsulate all of the unsafety. Uh, but sometimes you can't do that, and you're just stuck with thousands of lines of unsafe code, and you can't fully encapsulate it. But what you can do, for what you can do is you can write abstractions that just encapsulate some of the safety invariants, but not all of them. So the way you kind of approach this, or at least the way that I approach it, and the way that we did it in Bevy a few years ago, is that first we take a look at all of our unsafe code, all of it, and we try and figure out why we're using the unsafe code in the first place, because if we can just change it all to be safe code, then that's obviously a lot easier to maintain and reason about. Um, so we've got to do that. But then once you've identified why you're using the unsafe code, you can try and figure out if all of the safety invariants that you're having to reason about to ensure your code is correct are actually relevant for the reason why you're writing unsafe code in the first place. Like if you're using raw pointers instead of borrows, you've given up a bunch of guarantees and you want to make sure that you actually care about giving up all of those guarantees and it's not just one specific thing that you want to get rid of. Um, and then once you've done that, you can try and write an abstraction that just gives you back those guarantees and you still have to retain all of the flexibility that you get normally uh, for what you're trying to do. So this is an example from the Bevy game engine, but this talk isn't really about the Bevy game engine, so if you don't know anything about it, that's totally fine. We have this type that is effectively like a VEC, but we don't know what the type of the data we're storing is. And so we have this get function, and it returns a raw pointer. And that's not really what a VEC normally looks like. You'd normally return a borrow of some type T. And so in this case, that would be why we're using unsafe, because we don't know the type, so we have to use raw pointers because we can't use borrows. But maybe that's not entirely true. Maybe we could be using trait objects. So it's kind of important that when you're thinking about why you're using the unsafe code, that you make sure that you've kind of fully thought everything out and you don't just sort of stop at the very first thing that looks like it kind of explains things. So why don't we just use a borrow of a trait object here? And the answer, maybe somewhat unsatisfyingly, is just because wide pointers are bigger than thin pointers, and that's probably bad for performance in a game engine that has very tight performance requirements. So what we have here is instead of using a borrower of some unknown type, we are using a raw pointer. We've thrown away all of the lifetime guarantees we normally get, when really the only thing we care about is giving up the guarantee of what we're pointing to. And so what we can do is, now that we've figured that out, we can try and introduce an abstraction that gives us back the guarantees the borrowers have about the lifetime, but we still don't care about the type we're pointing to. So we can kind of see with these pointer and pointer mute types, they have the lifetime parameter, and they don't have the type we're pointing to. Um, and they just wrap a normal raw pointer, because that's still kind of what we're using. Um, phantom data tends to pop off a lot when you write these kind of abstractions, because we have this lifetime that we're not using, and phantom data is scary. Uh, it's easy to get wrong. And so typically what you want to do with phantom data in my experience is we kind of go back to what I was saying about figuring out why you're not using unsafe in the first place. And we try and just write the type that we would have written if we were using safe code. So here maybe you'd write a borrow of a trait object, but the trait object part doesn't really matter. So we're just using a borrow of a UA. Um, And one nice thing about having these abstractions is that it gives a place to put a bunch of documentation, both on the actual type itself, if the thing, if the reason for using unsafe code is very complicated, you have a nice place to put the documentation. In this case, it's not really that complicated, so the documentation here mostly just exists to explain the type rather than anything more interesting. But the kind of more interesting thing that it does is that if we go back to the function, we can see that we have the pointer type, and this kind of acts like documentation by itself. Previously, we were returning a raw pointer, and now we have this nice pointer type, which is telling us where the data that we're pointing to is coming from, how long we're allowed to keep the pointer around for, like when it's valid to dereference and all of that. 
And then when we actually do dereference it, the safety invariants are significantly simpler. The only thing we care about is what the type of the thing we're pointing to is. We don't care about any of the other validity things about dereferencing rule pointers. So that's quite nice. Um, and another nice thing about doing this, about putting the invariants that you expect to uphold about, about the nice thing about putting the invariants you expect to hold into the type system is the, the compiler will check it for you. So we've kind of said that we expect that we don't know what the pointer is, but we do know that the data is always valid. And by putting this here and then trying to replace all of the raw pointers in our code base with these types, maybe we realized that that's not the only reason we're using raw pointers. So this is still on this vec type. We have kind of the equivalence to remove and push. And they're just taking raw pointers, which is kind of weird. I mean, when you remove stuff from a vec, you don't get a reference back. You don't get a box back. You just get the data. And when you push stuff, you just pass ownership of your data. You don't provide it a reference to anything. So we can't just use the pointer types here, because that's not representing what we're actually doing. So we kind of have to go back to step one and figure out what are we using unsafe code for here? Why are we doing it? And in this case, it's still just we don't know what the type of the thing we're pointing to is. Uh, but it's kind of more complicated than that because, well, that doesn't really help us figure out what we're actually trying to represent with the raw pointers. And the primary thing, the interesting thing there compared to the previous example is the whole ownership thing, is that we're trying to represent that we're taking data out of this vec and we're giving ownership to the caller, uh, but we're not actually returning ownership of the place where the data is stored. So the data still lives in the vec, but the actual data itself, the responsibility for dropping it is the caller, and the caller is able to call read and move out of the pointer. And it's kind of the same thing with this initialize unchecked method, which is kind of like a push, is we take this value, which is a raw pointer, which is you know, not how VEC works, but we have reasons to be doing it differently. And it's the same thing. We are passing in kind of logical ownership of the value, but the actual place where the data is stored is the responsibility of somebody else. Maybe the value is on the stack somewhere. Maybe it's in another one of these VECs somewhere. So now we kind of want to figure out how can we write an abstraction that kind of models this weird ownership thing we have going on and gives us the lifetimes back so we know that everything's being sort of handled properly. Um, and so this is probably one of the more interesting abstractions is this owning pointer type. Um, and this actually does have a lot of documentation on it that is kind of important and useful when you're reading the code because the, what we're actually doing with those raw pointers was really complicated. And now we have a place to talk about it, whereas previously it was kind of just around the place and you kind of just had to get a feel for it. Um, we have the phantom data again. The phantom data in this example is more interesting to try and figure out because we definitely have some kind of reference thing going on here because it's a pointer. But what kind of type do we have in Rust where you have a reference to something but you kind of have ownership of it, but also you're not really supposed to deallocate it? And in the comments, we can see that we figured out that the type for that is a mutable reference to a manually drop of a trait object, which I don't know for certain, but I assume probably nobody here has ever encountered that type in practice. I don't think I ever have. So that's kind of weird, but that's kind of the type we're trying to model here with this owning pointer, that when you have it, your responsibility is to drop the thing you're pointing to, but other than that, it's not really anything to do with you. Um, and so having these types makes things a lot clearer. We actually have like a nice push method now that looks like what you might expect. The safety and variance for it are what you would expect because we're taking a raw pointer and we don't know what the data is, but we have to make sure that when we put data in the vec, it's of the right type. And so that's the only safety invariant in play. If we didn't have this owning pointer type, we'd have a safety invariant that was saying, when the pointer is valid for and saying that you shouldn't really be using it after you access the VEC again, because if you access the VEC again, you might remove or insert, which might write data over the place where we're actually storing the value that has been moved out of the VEC, which is very weird. Um, and we also have the remove function again, which returns this owning pointer. And again, we have the lifetime, which means that callers of this, they get the data and they don't really have to worry about anything. Um, 
I'm not sure if we had the must use before or after the PL that changed this, but must use is a very useful tool because if you don't have the must use, you might forget to use the owning pointer and then you're leaking memory. Um, and I think that was right. This actually did catch a specific instance of unsoundness in Bevy, which is a really good sign because if you do all of this work to make an abstraction to try and represent things in the type system and then you kind of don't find any issues in your code base that has like thousands of lines of unsafe code, then maybe your abstraction isn't really going to catch anything because if you have thousands of lines of unsafe code and it's pretty freshly written, I'd say chances are you've probably written a bug somewhere in there and finding it is a good sign. Uh, so in this case, we're removing data from this VEC type and if you recall, the data is still actually inside of the VEC, but we've just kind of moved logical ownership of it into the caller. And so we have to read the pointer to actually take it out of the VEC and into the function we're in. And if you don't do that, and then we call this arbitrary function f, uh, what can happen is that that function can cause stuff to be removed from this VEC and completely stomp all over the reference we've passed into it, which would be unsound. And Having this only pointer type means that the lifetimes were completely checked by the borrow checker, which catches this kind of thing. Um, and there's one more example of this kind of abstraction thing we did in Bevy, which is that we had this type that was constructed many, many times, and there are lots of them, and we do it constantly. And so we have these raw pointers. And this is an interesting case because we do actually know what we're pointing to. You can see we've got a pointer to a U size, a pointer to an entity, a pointer to a sparse set. And the only thing that seems to be missing is that we don't have a lifetime. And like, is that the reason we're using raw pointers here? Uh, so we kind of look into it and try and add all the lifetimes everywhere because maybe we can just be using borrows here anyway. And so we kind of went through all that process. And we find out the the reason we're using raw pointers isn't because the lack of lifetime, because we can get lifetimes here. It's, again, another kind of performance thing where the type we're pointing to is actually not a U size. It's not an entity. It's a slice of U size and a slice of entity. And because we just have so many of these structs and we make them so much, the size of them is really important. So we're once again trying to just have a thin pointer because it's faster. So we introduced this abstraction, which is basically just a borrow of a slice, except it's a thin pointer, which means it's unsafe because we don't know the length. And that was kind of the primary reason we have that. Um, an interesting thing about doing these kind of abstractions is that it kind of consolidates some of, it consolidates everything into kind of one location so you can have a debugger session for some of your safety invariants. For example, previously we had all of we had all of those pointers. We don't know what the length is, but so we're just kind of blindly doing pointer arithmetic. And we don't really have any checks that that's actually correct and that we tracked the length information correctly. Whereas now in debug mode, well, we actually have this length field. And because there's a single function to actually, because there's a single fun function on this, we have one place where we do all the indexing. We can just assert it, and we know that we're always asserting it correctly. The phantom data in this example is very simple because we know exactly what we're doing. It's just a reference to a slice, which is very simple. Um, and this is what it looks like after the abstraction. The types look significantly more complicated. Uh, there's the option, there's some unsafe cell now, there's lifetimes, it all looks very much more complicated. But it's kind of complexity that was already there. Like you can kind of see that we have these comments now, which is kind of trying to explain that actually this struct is sort of like an enum. Um, and previously that wasn't super obvious, and so you kind of make unrelated improvements when you do this kind of thing, so the diffs here are a bit weird. Uh, but yeah, it looks significantly more complicated, but it's complexity that was already there and just hidden, and so it's nice to have it surfaced, so when you're actually reading the code, or when you have new contributors, they don't, they don't and you don't mistakenly think things are simpler than they are, which is a good way to actually get soundness bugs in your code, because you don't understand what's happening. Um, so this is the PR that did it. It was a long time ago. I'm struggling to find the years, oh, like three years ago. It doesn't feel like three years ago, but yeah, that's, went significantly faster than I expected. That's the whole thing.